Thank you for your time. And uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the governor, the DS, other central bank officials, um, and friends. And I say friends because I have learned from just being in Fiji for only uh, four days now that it is a very friendly people, a very friendly nation, and it is indeed easy to make friends. Um, as I talk about um, you know, the Sri Lanka story, I, I'm going to up front make a big disclaimer, which is that uh, I will touch upon some comparisons, uh, but more analytical comparisons with Fiji. I'm not an expert in Fiji, and I've learned through many a debate with my wife about the law uh, that I should not be talking about things I don't know because she happens to be a PhD in law and she has reminded me often that I should keep my mouth shut as I learn on the subject matter. So I will um, touch on Sri Lanka for the most part, and uh, at the end, I think we can have a comparative discussion on um, these nations. Um, as Patai mentioned, you know, Sri Lanka has a rich history. Uh, Post-independence, this is something many of you may not know. Lee Kuan Yew, as he was taking over the Prime Minister's role in Singapore, said, I have a dream that one day Singapore will be like Sri Lanka. And, and clearly he was referring to Sri Lanka other than today's Sri Lanka. Uh, and it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't give me pleasure to talk about um, my homeland in, 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 in being in crisis and to talk about the things that people should not be doing. Uh, but I think it is of use. Uh, the example is now out there. Um, and I think it's a timely uh, period in which nations should be thinking about some of the factors that have gone wrong. Now, why is this important? Um, just Taking a step back, emerging market nations are at a very, very critical juncture at the moment. Um, 2022 is going to be a very tough time. Uh, US interest rates, US inflation, uh, Western inflation in general are on the rise. Uh, it is arguable that US monetary policy did not start tightening early enough. I think there was a big debate about whether inflation was permanent or transitionary, and therefore the, uh, the monetary policy responses were muted. Uh, now following that, what they have seen is that there's a lot of catch up to do. Um, I was just in the UK a few weeks ago. For the second month in a row, the UK's GDP uh, has dropped year on year. Uh, inflation is in the high single digits. Uh, these are uh, figures or indicators of crisis in other, in, in other times when most developed markets are running at close double digit inflation. So the policy response here is going to be, of course, that, um, it, that um, interest rates will continue to go up uh, in, in the US. Uh, and so for all emerging markets that have particularly any debt index to uh, US rates, obviously funding costs will go up. Um, and in addition, I have read that there are uh, a significant number of countries, emerging market countries, whose spread, I mean the difference between their debt and the US uh, rates, uh, are over 10% or 1,000 basis points. So um, that is showing that more and more countries will come into a challenging time this year. Um, markets have seen significant outflows uh, from, uh, emerging markets have seen significant outflows. Um, I think since the 1998 Asian economic crisis, this is perhaps the worst year in terms of flows to emerging markets. Now, that's not to put people um, on the back foot, but I think that's an important context in which we have to say that if, like Sri Lanka, over the last two years, <coughs> you have taken many missteps, then you're even going into gloomy periods. If, over the last couple of years, you have taken some of the right steps, then I think you're better prepared to weather the storm. Um, now before I get into this, I realize I'm missing one slide, which is a quick introduction on Sri Lanka's economy. Um, 
you heard earlier that it was about 160 feet, million Fijian, so about eight, I'll talk in US dollar terms, so about 18 billion uh, uh, US dollars uh, in terms of GDP. That was, if you ask me, on March 1st. Now that the economy and the, the currency has uh, gone from 200 rupees to the dollar to 360 at the moment, that has fallen to about 45 billion um, dollars of GDP. Um, so per capita GDP has gone from upper middle income slightly about $4,000 per capita to somewhere in the $2,000 plus range. Um, so that's, that's an important uh, factor, as you know. So the economy is primary, it's about 53% services, financial services dominate that. Um, about uh, 7 to 10% agriculture based, and then uh, the rest uh, manufacturing. Agriculture has been dominated by uh, exports in, in the form of uh, tea and rubber, and, and, and tea and rubber, uh, or rubber based products. Uh, our largest export has been apparel. Uh, about 5% of our GDP comes from apparel exports. Tourism is about, uh, was about 5% of GDP, so a lot lower in terms of tourism exposure than Fiji is. However, it was a very important part of our foreign currency. So COVID had a similar impact on our foreign reserves as it did on Fiji. Um, we also have a quite a large population of uh, about two or two and a half million uh, Sri Lankans who work overseas. So the remittances are, have been quite significant. It's about seven billion a year, dollars a year, US dollars a year, and it's peak a couple of years ago. Um, so that gives you a general sense of where we are, uh, what we uh, have been. We run twin deficits, you know, for most of uh, our time since independence. Independence came to us in 1948. Um, we also have had, um, you know, quite a lot of challenges, you know, socio-politically. Uh, some of you may know from 1983 up to 2009, we had a fairly fiercely fought um, civil war. Uh, so that was a huge drain on the investment and, and particularly government spending. Uh, at the same time, uh, through <coughs> policies around free education and, and free healthcare uh, from the 1940s, we have a high interest rate of about 94%. Uh, we have quite a few good um, universities. Uh, we have a very good uh, human uh, development index. So on, on a lot of those factors, um, Sri Lanka has been actually quite ahead of the region uh, in, in terms of, uh, when I say region, I mean South Asia. So including India, Pakistan, and, and so on. On many of those factors, uh, Sri Lanka has been far ahead. Uh, I think outside of the Maldives, which obviously has a heavy tourism flow relative to the tiny population, uh, we have had the highest per capita GDP in the region. Uh, and frankly, there was a time, and, you know, uh, up to a couple of years ago, when a lot of Indians and other South Asians aspired to have a second home in Colombo. Uh, because it's a beautiful place, it was clean, it was friendly people, a lot to do uh, in terms of tourism. Uh, so, you know, that was the type of nation that, you know, Sri Lanka has been and still can be. But we've taken some new steps and, and I'll walk you through um, some of that. So, um, let's just think about what's, what's happening on the ground at the moment. Right, so um, I've tried to speak through uh, or convey this through some images. Uh, starting early this year, we had power cuts. Power cuts that in early April went up to 13 hours per day. So, and this was due to a combination of um, you know, bad droughts, because 45% of our power at full capacity can come from hydropower. Uh, with the droughts, uh, that went down. We have um, a significant proportion of fossil fuel generated power from uh, oil as well as coal power. Um, the coal, um, you know, power station broke down for some time, um, and then that put a huge demand, obviously, on uh, oil imports that were required. Now, this is in the backdrop of oil prices going up, particularly you know, after the Ukraine war started. 
So with that, power cuts um, started impacting people. And I put in particular, of course, it impacts um, productivity, but it also impacted, um, you know, like a lot of um, human needs, like people going, you know, children going to exams or studying for their exams. Um, then you have the fuel crisis. Um, so whether it's, you know, the tuk-tuks I put there on the bottom, because that's 500,000 people, 500,000 tuk-tuk drivers who are self-employed and depend on the tuk-tuk income. Um, then of course, you know, um, other forms of transportation. Um, they've had, um, you know, these lines now for two months. <coughs> the lines go on sometimes for days. People park their cars at night and go home and come back to the car, just not so they don't lose their place in the line. Um, there have been deaths with people who've been staying in line for fuel through heat exhaustion, lack of food, things like that. And then finally, these blue gas cylinders. You know, a lot of people, of course, use gas, uh, LP gas, to uh, for, for cooking. Um, no power, if, even if you had an electric um, you know, stove, you can't really cook in it. Gas is now a problem. Um, and then, you know, that then led to a real foreign exchange shortage, which led to empty shelves and important things like um, milk powder, uh, foodstuffs, basic foodstuffs. Um, we were also at the same time going through a bit of a food shortage, which I'll come to in a moment, again due to a policy error. So that required more imported food. Um, so that again created, a, you know, when we were running out of uh, foreign currency, the food shortages uh, became uh, more exacerbated. Um, public hospitals did not have medicines. There are stories, many stories of, um, you know, patients who died. Uh, not, not hundreds, but you know, it's still, we would want life lost in that manner is, is an irresponsibility of uh, the people who made these decisions. Um, and, and no electricity, and then schools have now had to close. Because children can't get, children and teachers can't get to school. Because now there's actually a, a lack of fuel, not just a shortage. Now fuel is being rationed to uh, emergency. Uh, vehicles like you know ambulances and some public transportation. So I've, uh, for better or for worse, been out of the country for I guess four out of the last you know or three out of the last four weeks. So I haven't felt the worst of it, and I know when I go back, um, you know I will see this all around. And then you know of course that's uh, led to a lot of social social instability. Um, we've had. Um, and the social protest going on from the beginning of, uh, and from the end of March. That the trigger point was when power cuts went to over 13 hours a day. Um, I think, and what's interesting is these are apolitical protests. These protesters don't allow political groups to come in and, and, and be part of their protest. This is a young group, probably in their 20s and 30s. I've spent a bit of time with some of these protesters trying to understand them. Some of them have given up their jobs, saying my job's been or my company's been bankrupted because of these policies anyway. So I'd much rather come and do something turned around. Um, so that's how I, I'm giving you this flavor to start with because um, when you talk, read about a crisis, it just seems about numbers. This has gone way beyond that. This is for the first time this all-powerful ruling family People are unafraid of calling them out. People are unafraid of asking them to leave. And they could not have um, anticipated that or, or assumed that would happen two years ago, a year ago. So that is how deeply people are affected by this. And um, that's, that's, I think, the human side of the story, which is what any politician, any economist, any business leader, or any citizen would want to know about. So how did we get there? So, you know, I'll, I'll just take a step back to post-independence uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, we've run twin deficits, um, budget deficits as well as 
uh, trade deficits for pretty much all of uh, post independent uh, life. In 1954, I believe there was a primary surplus in the budget um, that was the last time. Uh, and then since then, uh, we've had uh, strong public investment, strong subsidies. So market distortions. Now, take, for example, the price of fuel. Today, the price of fuel is about three and a half times what it was two months ago. Because finally, the government decided they need to um, you know, uh, remove the subsidies, which were one of the biggest drains on, on the economy. Um, we had a civil war, which is very unfortunate. And, and I think you know, the lesson learned here is for any country that's on a pretty good track. And then frankly, up to 1983, when the war started, Sri Lanka was back on a very good track after a dark period during the 1970s. Uh, and then this war derailed it. Um, one of the more important things, um, factors, salient factors from that was the brain drain, the migration of um, you know, talent that came about because of the war. And then, you know, political patronage. Um, what, I, what do I mean by that? You know, every so often, you know, you have elections. It could be the national elections or the local government elections. And, you know, people took, a, uh, certainly in the last 20 or 25 years, um, all political parties took it upon themselves to make <coughs> excessive promises, promises they couldn't keep, promises if they kept were going to destroy the nation. And, and I think that leads to why um, why we run these deficits. Um, and, and I'll come back to how we sort of try to fix that. Then in 2007, we started borrowing in the capital market. Before that, we had, you know, we have lower income and therefore we had access to a lot of concessional uh, lending. Um, but from 2007 onwards, and mind you, this is still before the end of the war, uh, we started borrowing, issuing sovereign bonds. Um, initially, they were small, $500 million, uh, and then in increasingly, we did, you know, $500 million bonds over the next several months. Um, but however, at the same time, particularly post-2007, post the war ending in 2009, there was a lot of public investment. And as a person who comes from the investment industry, I would say these were debt funded without any analysis on the return on investment on, on some of this. And some of this was unsolicited. And this is one area where we see huge projects, particularly Chinese government funded projects where we had unsolicited uh, projects where we went and built an airport where there, there are no uh, you know, planes landing there even now. It was turned into a grain area for some time. Um, they built a harbor, which the government <coughs> didn't know what to do with, and eventually did a debt for equity swap with the Chinese um, uh, you know, ports company. and, and, um, uh, and if, if they are able to make something out of it, I think uh, that would be great. Uh, there is a, when you come into Colombo, you'll see, a, I don't know, it's probably a 100 meter telecommunications tower, uh, which cost, and that was not one of the bigger investments, still $120 million debt. Um, no one knows what happens there. Um, you know, they're supposed to have restaurants and entertainment zones, and, you know, you know so. So a lot of, um, I, I say Sri Lanka didn't have a white elephant, it had a herd of white elephants. Um, and unfortunately, that's something what we, what we are struggling with. And, and that's the point I want to make there, which I think is relevant to every country, every policymaker, is debt can be good debt, bad debt, cheap debt, expensive debt, but you've got to make sure your return on investment is evaluated just like if you were in a your own business, you're taking a loan, and you would not take a loan at you know 12% if your return is 8%. Right? So it's just simple common sense. Um, then in, you know there were there's a government change. Um, you brought in a slightly more technocratic government. In 2016, they started re-engaging the IMF and entered an IMF program. And as a result of that, we achieved our first primary uh, budget balance uh, surplus in, since 1954. Um, so now I'm going to come back to this, but I want to also point out Sri Lanka has been in 16 IMF programs, 16. 
<coughs> most of those did not actually go to fruition, right? Because two years down a three or four year program, the government decided, hey, we don't want the discipline of this anymore. So if, if there's a pattern of, um, you know, again, going back to political patronage. Um, then in 2019, we had the April Easter attacks, and that's relevant because that was the first hit on our tourism earnings. As I said, it's, it's tourism earnings, so only 4%, uh, about 4 to 5% of the economy, but it was a significant foreign exchange. And then at the end of the year, you had elections where uh, the old pre-2015 government uh, made a comeback based on the fact that you know, an, an argument of security, which is a result of the Easter attacks, and an argument of growth, which was a result, ironically, of the shrinkage of the economy that came with the discipline of an IMF program. So yes, it did. Um, if the economy didn't shrink, growth shrunk. Growth fell from about five and a half percent before five to five and a half percent before the IMF program to um, about three and a half percent. Um, but again, you know, selling a very short-term story about shrinking growth without really understanding the point that we were now in a primary surplus and potentially on a path to sustainability. Um, so then that popular manifesto, populist manifesto, ended up in a tax cut in December 2019. Now granted, those policymakers didn't know there was you know, a virus coming their way, uh, or coming the way of the world, and that that would create a lot of issues, but uh, I'll walk through quickly why that was relevant, but this was a tax cut on personal income taxes, increasing the thresholds by six times, the minimum um, you know, annual income was 300,000 um, you needed to earn rupees uh, to pay taxes. It went, uh, sorry, 600,000, that went up to 3 million. Um, then pay as you earn taxes were removed, and I still don't understand why. Um, withholding taxes, which were paid um, on, on interest, were removed, and then you had to declare that as part of your income, which meant first, you're not collecting at source like you used to. Second, it created uh, more opportunity for tax evasion. Corporate taxes uh, will move from 28 to 24%. Uh, the other very important and most immediate collection item was value added tax. They removed, uh, changed value added tax from 15% to 8%, cut it in half. Uh, and also, the companies that were liable for value added tax, they increased the threshold, revenue threshold for companies who are liable for it by its about 16 times. 16 times. Right? So you see that there's a whole range of policy errors, and we still don't know who, who, who advised these, but you can only assume that these were just populist. And then, as I mentioned, in, in addition to those three areas of taxes, the methodology of collections was disrupted. Um, so then, of course, 2020, um, you know, COVID hit, hit us, hit the world, uh, and that resulted in another series of policy missteps. And I'm going to go through those steps um, one by one, so I will, um, you know, come to that. Now, what's really important, because if you think about, you know, many of the root causes of where we are now go back to post-independence era, but you know, let's fast forward to 2016 when we, to 19, when we looked like we were on the up again. So what changed? In 2019, this issue of tax cuts was actually one of the most important things. Even before that, our tax revenue, government revenue to GDP was hovering around 12 and a half percent. And by all, you know, comparisons, that was slow. With the tax cuts in 2020, um, that came down to 8%. There are literally only about seven or eight countries who had a tax revenue to GDP ratio that was lower than that. And of course, you know, that has stayed. And, and worse than that, 
because of the tax base going down, our tax revenue, our interest expense to revenue shot up. It was in the, uh, it was about 50, 47% in 2019. And then last year it ended up um, at about 72%. So you see, for every rupee of earnings, 70 cents were still just being, just paying interest. So it became very clear that there was a debt sustainability issue and that became clear in 2020. So what this did, with the reduction of uh, revenue income, clearly the credit rating agencies who were rating our sovereign bonds took a look at it. And they didn't do it immediately, but particularly, um, they did it in two steps, but particularly by the time COVID hit, um, they had no choice but to downgrade. Um, so we, I, I haven't shown the first downgrade, which happened in April 2020. What I've shown is the, the rating at the end of each year. But first, we went from you know B2 or B flat to B minus. Uh, now, B minus means you're literally on the edge. Right? It doesn't take you, you, someone just needs to sneeze and you can fall on the wrong side. Um, and when this happened, and, and I think this is a learning for any responsible government, there are two ways you can respond to this. <laughs> you can sit, sit, get your best friends and say, how am I going to get my rating back to single B flat and then go to double B range, which we have had in the past. Or you could do what policymakers did, which was to discredit the rating agencies and call them names and say, you know, these guys don't know what they're talking about. Two years later, I think that's a different debate. But um, so then, of course, uh, before we go into 2020 and 21, certainly after COVID hit, we went to you know CAA, and what that did was it closed off capital markets. So the capital markets were not accessible to Sri Lanka anymore. So. So that's a good starting point. Um, so pre-COVID disrupted our uh, financial consolidation, um, tax reductions, as, as I mentioned, across all those elements. So the first thing that happened was capital markets close. Second, the, particularly with COVID, the government deficit started ballooning. Because now you had much lower revenue and you had significant um, investment needs to protect the, the citizens as well as the economy indirectly. Uh, and at the same time, tourism was impacted. So just to give you a sense, we had about, in 2018, I uh, used eight, 2018 rather than 19 as our base year because that was pre-Easter attacks. Um, and before Easter attacks, we, in 2018, we had two and a half million tourists um, in Sri Lanka. They're estimated to have spent about four and a half billion in foreign currency. Um, so that tourism impact by April, May, obviously that fell to zero. Um, so that income stream fell to zero. Now again, at this stage, I think the government, uh, forward-looking government or policymakers, had two options. They could either say we have a problem, one's our own doing, which is a tax cut, the other is COVID, which is unanticipated. There was enough sympathy at that time still, from, you know, multinational organizations and others to say, because of COVID, you know, we will support you. Um, and then we could have gone about establishing a plan that could have got our credit ratings upgraded and reopening capital markets to us. The other option, if you do not want to go down that path, was to restructure your debt. Because immediately when COVID hit, what became very clear is your debt load was not sustainable at face value. So you had to start um, uh, you had to start restructuring your debt. So unfortunately, neither of those options were chosen. Um, so then obviously with this ballooning budget deficit, you resorted to the one other tool governments have, which is printing money. 
So we printed um, about um, you know two and a half trillion rupees. Obviously, it might not mean much to you in rupee terms, but so the, uh, the money supply went up about you know two hundred percent. So that is how significant this was. Um, that brought uh, interest rates <coughs> down, um, obviously creating a lot of consumption, unnecessary consumption as well, and and. There were a lot of you know alarm bells also about potential inflation at that time, which once again um, there were public statements made by people as you know you know senior central bankers and finance ministry officials saying money printing does not cause inflation. So I had to go and I, I my first instinct was to call my business school and ask for a refund on what they had told me. <laughs> Um, so as excessive money uh, printing started, um, we also saw, you know, objective investors realize the going was getting tough. So portfolio uh, investment outflow started. So we've had significant portfolio inflows, particularly to the treasury bond market because rates were quite high and interest uh, and the exchange rate um, was fairly stable until then. Um, so then you started seeing those outflows. Uh, the equity markets previously, I think, uh, uh, put it again in rupee terms, um, the worst year of outflows was a net outflow of two and a half billion rupees. 2020, we had 55 billion rupees of outflows. Similarly, from uh, the government treasury market, I, don't, I, can't, I can't remember in terms of numbers, but at its peak, 10 to 12 percent of local currency treasury bonds and bills were owned by foreigners that went down to under 1% in that That's because, of course, those investors saw, um, as, as, as they say in Sri Lanka, coming color no good. Um, and then, as a result of that, the call started to be louder about going to the restructure, uh, to the IMF for a restructuring um, deal. Now, this is a government who Immediately after coming to power in 2019, cancelled the previous IMF program, which had um, got us to a primary surplus. So, so what I've highlighted in red are the proactive actions taken by policymakers. The rest is more things that were either, um, you know, passive actions or you know, contextual action uh, occurrences, circumstances. So they started resisting uh, the calls to go to the IMF. And so we went through 2020 with the hope that COVID will go away, tourism will return, uh, remittances will return. Because by then, um, so in April, May 2020, remittances took a hit, but then they had started coming back. So they thought remittances are fine, tourism will uh, come back. But we all know what happened with the COVID uh, you know, uh, continuation. Um, amid that, in, so there was still tightness in the foreign currency situation. So then a group of people got around the president and uh, the medical government, medical officers association said that we have a big problem with kidney disease because we use chemical fertilizer. There are NGOs who sustainability uh, made sustainability arguments, and that that wasn't incorrect. And then some of the economic policymakers jumped on that bandwagon, realizing, okay, I've got about 150 million dollars to pay out for importing fertilizer. If I can jump on this bandwagon, I can, uh, you know, cut that. So overnight, literally overnight, they made a decision to go from allowing chemical fertilizer to banning all chemical substances for agriculture. Now, again, I spoke, my, the first thing I did was I called some of the uh, best agri-experts I know, and what they said was spot on. They said, this is going to reduce overall yields. There's a portion of agriculture which just could not grow without chemical fertilizer, and there's another portion which could grow but would have a severe impact on uh, yields. And they said at the time, you're looking at a 50% drop in yields. Um, and the reason that's relevant is we ended up having to import 
worsening an already bad foreign currency situation later in the year. Um, then the fixed exchange, when all of this was coming, and, and you know, we, we, we saw that um, we had a lot of issues. You know, one thing you had to do was at least let imports correct themselves based on um, proper foreign exchange policy. So then the government, you know, I think they thought nominally that politically it was not expedient to say that the currency has depreciated under us. Um, and they held the currency at 200 rupees a dollar. Now what did that do? You saw an FX shortage as well as a black market. White in black market. There's always a black market, but that could have been 5 to 10 percent difference. But this black market then went to 30 to 40 percent difference versus the official rate. Now, this had a deep impact on the one part of our foreign exchange flows that, that was actually happening well, which is remittances. Because all these foreign workers, you know, they always had the black market, but they said, you know, 5% difference, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play by the rules. I'm gonna take the 5% hit, and I'm gonna go through the banking system, and I'm gonna send my money through the banking system, and that was adding to official reserves. When the gap got to 30-40%, they said, you know what, I'm going to at least try this out. I'm going to try out this Hawala systems and Mundial systems, or, you know, where, because a lot of those workers work in the Middle East. And they started using that. So I will show you the data, and that started having an impact on the one foreign day earning stream that was actually going pretty well for us. And once they did it, the first month, the second month, they realized, you know what, I can trust this. You know, I said I, I give someone my you know dollars or dirhams here, and my family gets the rupees over there. It works. Um, so with that, remittances started plummeting, and add to that, you know, Russia, Ukraine. We all know what happened uh, with that in terms of fuel price as well as uh, food price, uh, and and we had rapid inflation. So inflation, year on year, monthly inflation last month was about forty-seven percent. Food inflation was 53%, um, non-food inflation or core inflation, uh, no, not core, but non-food inflation was about 30, in the high 30s, so um, that's where we are in terms of. And, and leading up to March, we had continued, continued denial of a need to restructure. I was on a um, road show in my role as chairman of the stock exchange, we had a road show in in the UK in March, um, and I was being quite honest, you know, uh, and I said, look, things aren't looking great, but at least we feel we've come to the edge of the abyss where now our policymakers will learn that there's no way but doing it right. Following me, there were senior officials, I will mention names and titles, who said, we are not going to be fought. 18 days later, on April 18th, we announced that we are going to uh, miss, uh, and actually a few days before that, we, that we announced we're going to miss uh, or defer our payment of um, the foreign currency borrowings that were due for the first time in history. So, we've now, as you heard earlier, we've effectively run out of usable reserves. There's a number, I think, 1.9 billion of reserves that were quoted. Actually, 1.5 billion of that is not usable. That's 1.5 out of the 1.9 is a Chinese a central bank swap. That swap, uh, the usability is dependent on two things. One is your foreign reserves must cover three times imports. We were now at one time, so under one time. Second issue was that it was a Chinese yuan swap. So you could only use that for yuan-based expenses. <coughs> So we, we had pretty much run out of foreign reserves by April, and that's when the crisis in its current form started. So just very quickly, I, I spoke about this already. Um, if I compare 2018 to 2021, the inflows of foreign funds, the dark blue uh, bar at the bottom, for anyone who can't see at the back, is tourism earnings. 2021, of course, that fell probably by about 97%. Uh, workers' remittances, which are quite healthy, um, were healthy in 2021, but dropped, but it doesn't show 
the trend that started in the interim year. Uh, inflows to the government, obviously, you know, portfolio investments into government securities, long term loans, international sovereign bonds, syndicated loans, that shrunk as well. And then everything else is really pretty much noise, nothing significant. Now, this is important because this shows you the impact of what I mentioned. So, the tourism, uh, monthly tourism uh, rent, uh, earnings are in the dark blue line or the light blue line. And sorry, the worker remittances are in blue, the worker remittances. In yellow, you have tourism earnings. Now, starting at the uh, beginning of COVID in March 2020, <coughs> Tourism earnings literally fell to zero. Um, worker remittances took a dip, as I mentioned, but then they were back up. But then, this is the period when you had that distorted exchange rate, when the black market and the official <coughs> market started to gap by about 30%. So then you see how the blue line also started to drop. Remittances started to drop. And then, of course, tourism was just starting to take off when our crisis hit, the current crisis in its current form, which meant, you know, questions about can I get from, you know, A to B, from the airport to my hotel, does the hotel have electricity, will they have food, all of that, and now I think tourism has also taken a bit of a vaccine. So, I, I thought this was, um, Quite funny, there's a tweet I just saw this morning. <coughs> um, why do people feel let down? Because in December, November 2019, the election was based on creating this glorious nation. There were promises made, there were you know visions developed of this incredible, you know paradise nation that was going to be created if you give this political group a vote. And I'm not a political person, I don't belong to a political party, I've never taken a government appointment. Um, I'm a business person, I've studied economics, and I've also studied, you know, science. So I like to think about cause and effect, and, and, and that's all I'm explaining now. This is not political views. So on the left, you see one of the images from the political campaign. The man sitting there is the current president, uh, Gautabe Rajapaksa. He's the brother of um, the former president, who until recently was the prime minister, and also <laughs> brother of uh, the former speaker of the house, and also brother of the president who was a finance minister until uh, recently. <laughs> and the uncle of uh, the former president's son, who also had multiple ministries. Um, so, you know, it says what we ordered was on the left hand side. The president who promised to take care of its citizens. And what, we've what he's delivered is on the right hand side. It's the true picture of a little girl pushing the tuk tuks that are parked at a fuel line. Because that girl is, you would ask, why is she in the school clothes and not in school? She's probably waiting for that tuk-tuk that her father is filling up to take her to school. So she's not doing that. She's trying to help her father fill the fill tank, right? So what have we learned? Now, I, I, I think I've talked through the economics of this, right? But, but you know, if, if you're a manager, if you're a manager of an economy, if you're a manager of a business, what are the real sort of underlying root causes here? If you think about how this government came to power, I think the red flags were already there. So they ran an ethno-nationalist policy agenda. To me, most times when that happens, it in implies to me that there is a deficit in economic policy thinking. And I think that's very important to remember because if you have a good story that you can deliver. I think politicians, by being politicians, will typically try to bring communities together. Now, Sri Lanka has three different um, uh, communities, the majority Sinhala community, the Tamil community, and the Muslim community. And as I mentioned, the civil war earlier, that was ethnically based. So this is a country that needed a lot of reconciliation. 
But 10 years after the war, they went on a platform that was dividing the nation again. So when that happens, and they, they exploited the Easter attacks, uh, but that, that was a red flag, right? That was a red flag in, a, in, a, in an economy that was just turning around in terms of budget deficits. That is always something that you have to be very, very careful about. Because what it does is it, it, it tells people, this is what is most important. It's not your welfare. It's not whether you have food on your table. What is most important at this, that, that I am going to protect your origin. I'm going to protect your uh, ethnic group. And it was interesting, for the first time, you saw um, huge um, polarization in the voter base. If you look at the provinces that were dominated by certain ethnic groups. The second thing I would say, again, this doesn't relate just to the last two years, but you know, to a good 25 years. Decision makers and the bureaucracy must have technical proficiency and expertise. I always say this to people when, you know, many of you might be from business backgrounds. If you're looking for a board member, if you're looking for a CEO, a CFO, a CEO to run your organization, you'll be very careful about whom you pick. Because you want to know that they're technically capable of doing the job and that they have all the other skills. You will not hire someone who's great at you know, public relations, but would not know, um, you know, what, what your uh, what your business is. So, so I think that was very important here because we went from having, so, and I'm, you know, I, and there were many flaws in the previous government as well. But the point is, we when we came, when when this group came into power, a huge number of them had not gone past that grade in high school, right? So, uh, because, if, because these people then end up making the decisions that will impact you and your children. And so that's a very important consideration that we have learned. But uh, like the example I mentioned earlier, when someone comes to the government and says, I've got a wonderful you know, financing package for you for this billion dollar investment, um, you know, take it. Someone's got to sit there and say, okay, you've got to think through that. I'll get a billion dollars, my foreign reserves will look good, but what am I going to do with that? Right? Is that going to generate more for me than I have to pay in interest? So those types of analyses, I think, you know, the capacity building for that is very important in the Indian government. Uh, and by government, I don't just mean the politicians, right? The bureaucracy as well. Um, and then you do need, um, Coordinated fiscal and monetary policy, but one that is also, you know, uh, those are that are independent. <coughs> um, because what happened over the, the the last two years was basically the gov then governor of the central bank. Now we have two governors heads. Then governor of the central bank, he was an academic. He had never held a, uh, even a departmental post, um, and he he just was executing on behalf of the uh, government, or, you know, on behalf of politicians. And I think that's the critical factor. I think there's got to be, always got to be coordination. I don't believe in this purist approach in emerging markets of a strictly independent, um, you know, finance ministry. And, and I don't know how it works here, so I hope I'm not offending anyone. Uh, but, but a strictly independent ministry and a central bank, I think they need to coordinate uh, and work together. Uh, but we do need to have uh, an element of understanding the role of monetary policy and fiscal policy and, uh, and how those interrelate. Um, so the fourth thing is, I think we also found that structurally low interest rates are very important for an economy, right? So the wrong way to do that is through money printing. I think that creates a knock-on impact of multiple issues. Um, issues with your trade deficit, issues of inflation, ultimately issues of uh, foreign reserves. Uh, I think the right way to do that is, is, you know, once again, I look at this with my investment in corporate training as managing my balance sheet, right? <clears throat> Have I got the right mix of debt and equity? 
on my balance sheet. Have I got the right mix of local and foreign? And that's important because, you know, especially for smaller countries, there are very different pools of funding, right? I, I presume in a smaller nation like Fiji, the local capital pool has its limitations, so you obviously have to approach um, foreign funding, and then, and that uh, done right, I think, will lead to lower local interest rates. Um, is it short term or long term? Um, you know, that's what we, we have this phenomenon of bunching our capital repayments in our debt. So, starting this year, we have these bunches of five to seven billion dollars of repayments. That's not sustainable if you, unless you know the revenue and productivity has kept up. Um, so that's why I say short term versus long term maturity management and, and then concessional versus market pricing. Now I understand that a lot of the debt in Fiji, the foreign debt, is not uh, capital market debt. It's not bilateral debt, but more multilateral. So I think that's, I'm assuming I haven't looked at the data, I'm assuming you have pretty good rates on that. I think when those are available, I think it's very important. And particularly in a time like this, Fiji has the advantage of been seen as a bit of a darling in, in terms of being subject to a lot of climate related events and therefore um, you have an opportunity I think of, of attracting some attractive debt. Um, I wouldn't say no to that. Um, and, and then the final point um, I've already made which is business decisions uh, or, or public investment decisions need to be made with analytical rigor. And this seems like a technical sort of middle management you know, thing I'm saying, it's not. It's not. Right? It's really not. So um, this, this is what gets you into trouble. Right? So that's, that's sort of some of the key lessons. Now, I'm going to stop there, but I, I just last night at an event I was at, I had um, a few people who understood that I was speaking today asked me about the differences and similarities between Sri Lanka and Fiji and whether Fiji could go down the route of um, Sri Lanka. So, as I said in the beginning, I'm not an expert on Fiji. Um, you should not be taking opinions from someone who's you know, spent three or four days here. Having said that, I looked at some of the you know, uh, data to see what we could uh, infer from it. So, I know there's a lot of data here, so apologies if you can't see it at the back. First of all, I think tax revenue to GDP right, is really important. Um, we were already low at 12.7% in 2019 before COVID and before those tax cuts. In 2019, Fiji was at 27%. That is where Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka's aspiration was to get to 20. So 27% I think is very, very, very solid. Um, then after the COVID year, um, we dropped to 9.8%. Fiji dropped as well um, to 20%. Again, that seems like a drop, but from Sri Lanka's point of view, that was our aspiration. Our aspiration was to get to 20%. Um, then how much of that are you paying as interest? Right, Interest to revenue in 2019 was 48% for Sri Lanka. It was 11% for Fiji. Again, that means 90% of your tax revenue is going to operating or capital expenses. Um, that blew up to 70% for Sri Lanka. And even the worst, after the worst pandemic, that went up to 17% for Fiji. So that, again, I would say you're in a very comfortable position. Uh, then starting debt to GDP, uh, it was 87%, already very high for Sri Lanka. Um, and that went to 120%, which is where we are now, probably a little bit higher. We would be higher, except we can't borrow anymore. <laughs> um, and um, Fiji started at 49%, I think you're at 79%. Of course, you have to put that in context of Fiji's uh, denominator dropping by 20%. I don't think the debt load has gone up by 30%. I think it's just that GDP fell by 20%, then again 5% last year. Now that it's back on the up, uh, and it seems like it is. I was uh, speaking not just current arrivals, but um, on bookings, forward bookings as well um, for Fiji for tourism, and they seem to be already up above 2019 levels. So 
Um, I think you should expect um, rates um, come up, and I saw in the presentation, Governor, you made that on average forecasts are for possibly high single digits growth this year. Um, so you're, you're seven, at 79, which is still better than where Sri Lanka was before the pandemic, and that's seemingly improving. Uh, reserves coverage, we were at 4.6 months of imports reserves in 2019. That is now fallen to 0.8 times. That 0.8, by the way, is including the, the 1.5 billion China swap. If you take that out, that's about 0.2. Basically, we've run out of reserves. Um, in in uh, Fiji, you were at five months before the pandemic, and you're at eight months. Now, I looked, um, again, just desktop research. I haven't you know, delved into it. It looks like that came from some you know, fixing debt that, that you took. Now, I think it, for someone like me who's following financial markets, I think that is, that is a very, very um, smart move. Because as I said earlier, I think you're going to have an incredibly difficult time. All emerging markets are going to have an incredibly difficult time raising debt in this environment. So yes, multilateral and concessional lending might be available. But capital market lending, going to markets, is going to be very, very tough um, you know, going forward this year. So I think you're in a good spot there. Um, again, pre the tax cut, um, you know, our credit rating was at B, B minus. Um, and, and of course, after that, we are now, you know, in the NR or UR, the still says, you know, uh, below the triple C. Um, and then Fiji, after the pandemic, I think you had a downgrade during the pandemic, and you're still at a B plus. So I think that's a that's a good place to be. Um, Country-wise, you know, GDP per capita on a purchasing power parity basis. Um, Sri Lanka is a little bit higher, I think, on, on a dollar basis. Of course, that's going to go down significantly in 2022 because of the currency devaluation, and then would be below Fiji's number. Uh, but they're roughly in the same ballpark. <coughs> Right, 14 to 12,000. But one thing I was quite um, taken up by is the Gini index. Now, I don't know how many of you follow the Gini index. Um, the Gini index uh, tells you, obviously, the level of equality of income distribution. And a higher, if, if you have an index of 100, that means one person in that country has all the wealth and the others, or all the income and the others have zero. If it's um, at zero, that means everyone has equal income. So the lower, the better. Um, so there again, in Sri Lanka from 2009, which is when the war ended, and I used different years not to game the numbers, but because this is not reported every year for every country. Um, in 2009, um, we were at 36, that's gone up a bit, which means inequality has got a little worse. Whereas in Fiji, that number has gone from 40 in 2008 down to 30, which is a significant drop. That's a 33% drop in that number. So just by looking at this, my view and my response to the people who asked me the question yesterday is I think you're in a much safer place. I think the starting point is better. We have, of course, shown as a country very unfortunate that with a great starting point, you can end last. Um, so, you know, my, my uh, you know, best wishes to uh, everyone at the central bank and the ministry that uh, that those distractions don't come your way. Um, but, but I don't think there is any risk of any of what happened in Sri Lanka happening, because Sri Lanka didn't have that risk even in November 2019. It was a bunch of willful, deliberate missteps that took Sri Lanka there. So there is no pandemic, there is no cyclone that is going to take you there on its own. Unless you are asleep at the wheel. And I think that's the responsibility that was um, you know, missed in Sri Lanka. I think while all the change is happening, um, there were, they emphasized matters other than being honest, being transparent, and taking the bull by the horns and solving it. So that's why, in a sense, I don't have anything earth shattering to tell you, except mismanagement can take you there. Um, 
from these numbers, I don't think Fiji is at a point where uh, anything, any natural disaster can take you there overnight. Right? I think with a little bit of management, um, Fiji is on a much, much better footing. It's on a much better footing now post-pandemic than Sri Lanka was pre-pandemic. So I, I will leave it at that uh, because I have probably gone over. But uh, not to take any questions, but again, I think I, in, in the Q&A, I, I will say that um, I, I will be able to speak more about the Sri Lanka context and the Fiji context, uh, obviously. Um, so we'll open it up. Thank you, Mr. Fernando, for the insightful presentation. Uh, just for the Q&A today, we'd like to divide it up into two segments. The first is on Sri Lanka-related questions, and then we'll move on to the relevance and lessons for Fiji. Uh, at this point, I also acknowledge the presence of the Permanent Secretary of the Economy, so any Fiji-related questions here will be in the session for the economy on that. So uh, remember, we had mentioned this Slido app. Uh, you could uh, put in your questions via this app. You can post the questions electronically, so, but if you want to raise your questions here in the audience, we can also accommodate that. And uh, probably we'll start with some of the questions probably that we have been drawing in from uh, to the moderators, or if someone in the audience would like to, to start off. But probably I'll start off with uh, Mr. Fernando on this uh, crisis. Uh, how do you pin down? Is it an economic crisis that morphed into a political, or is it a political crisis that morphed into an economic, or is it a combination of both? Yeah, I, I think um, I wouldn't say it was a political crisis that um, was a causal factor. I, I think. <laughs> um, I, I think, in fact, in fact, the president, in, when he was elected in 2019, November, came in with a majority of about 60%. So that is not, you know, the foundation of a political crisis. That actually tells you it was very strong political footing. But I think the point I made earlier, which is you, have a, you, you might have political strength, but if it is based on the wrong, you know, ideology, where it was not based on an economic ideology, it was not based on an ideology of prosperity for your nation. It was instead based on uh, if you got that political strength and the vote base from something else like in our case was ethno-nationalism, I don't think you really have a game plan to, do, to figure out what you do the next day. And, and actually, there, there was a big document which had all these targets, but none of it said, how do you do it? So I think it was an economic, uh, it was a strong political um, force that brought in a, com a combination of um, lack of transparency and accountability, incompetence, unwillingness to take out the ideas from outside, and perhaps some corruption, which led to then an economic uh, crisis, which led to political instability, and not quite a crisis, instability. So it's more to do with who's in power now and how much strength they have, rather than you know, anything else. Thank you for that. So there was a question on whether there will be some printing of money and <laughs> some use at the end of this. I believe if you were following the idea, please, you would have noted that the RBF has injected already 1.6 billion into the economy. I don't think the government uh, has an ever tried to print some more money for this. Place. So the second question is, uh, in your opinion, what is the way forward for civil rights economy? Yeah, so, you know, from here on, um, you know, they have engaged with the IMF. Um, so IMF discussions are, have started. They've just completed a staff level um, discussion this week. Um, so there are two issues that the IMF wants, uh, and this is what might take more time. One is they want to see a debt sustainability plan. Secondly, they want to see a fiscal sustainability plan. So what that means is path forward to balancing the budget. What, and, and that means cutting your costs. The budgets are not complicated. You can either increase your revenues or cut your costs. Um, you know, a big part of the drag in the budget deficit is 
uh, subsidies and funding of state-owned enterprises, which are huge loss makers. Uh, three, three of our uh, state-owned enterprises, the National Airline, the, um, the Petroleum Corporation, and the Electricity Board, they account, their losses account to 60 to 75% of the budget deficit. So those have to be fixed, right? So Sri Lankan Airlines has to run like a business. Uh, I, I, I mean, to talk about what's happened with the airline, that will take another information session. Um, the Petroleum Corporation, uh, again, you know, they had they subsidized. The previous government brought the pricing formula. Um, the new government rubbished it, and now they've gone back to the pricing formula. And now with oil at 120, they still play catch up. Um, even if you do that, you will make profit on a gross profit level, but not on the, you know, after admin expenses. Third, this electricity board. The electricity prices have to, if you want to cover the cost of the electricity board, uh, you have, prices have to go up three times. You know, and by any stretch of the imagination, that would be political suicide. But that's because we have a bloated electricity board, which is three times the size that it should be. So state-owned enterprise restructuring will have to be um, a big part of fiscal consolidation. I think um, managing um, hiring in the government, um, you know, people, I don't know how the system works here, but there, you don't have, a, for government works, you don't have a problem with them, but you get a lifetime pension you know that. So a lot of people just want to be there, not because it's the best job for the, while they're working, but it's the best job for when they're not working. Um, so I think some of those things will have to be reviewed. Um, and, and I think um, basically on the revenue side, taxes already have gone up, tax collection will have to go up. You saw the numbers. You know, you're in a bad year, you're at 20% tax to GDP. In a, in a good year, we were at 12. Um, so too many loopholes, too much tax avoidance. Um, and um, so I think especially, you know, um, sort of, taxing and source needs to improve. Um, so all of those need to come together, and then you can look at the debt restructuring. Look, it's a simple story. You're gonna to have to take a 30%, at least 30% back up on the debt you have. Um, try and get all your debt holders um, to agree to that. And uh, the good news is there are countries who have done this, gone through this process in six months and got an immediate upgrade from, you know, less than triple C to single B. So it can be done, but you need the political will. I, I say you need to get all the ducks in a row to move fast. The way I see it, some of the ducks are still flying out there, so they're not, not in a row. But if you do that, I think within by the end of the year, I think we could get our first funds from the IMF. So we have come to know, we have outlined this request and probably more demands. Do you think the political environment can accommodate this at this stage with all the frustrations that are happening on the ground? It's a good question, and I think that's the dilemma. But I, I, I would, I would play it differently, right? I think meeting basic needs like fuel, food security, and that's why they are getting a lot of assistance. Fuel, food security, um, you know, power, uh, and education healthcare, medicines. I mean, I would ring fence th those first and say, yes, I'm gonna do this first before I think about any cuts. But beyond that, you know, I, I think it's up to any good government to communicate to their constituency what happens if we don't make this change. But if we don't make this change, we will have 50% of people below the party line. If we do, don't make this change, people will not have milk powder for their children. Uh, we can all get into the bicycle manufacturing industry because that will be our only source of transportation because there will be no fuel to run our cars and buses and trains. Um, so it, it is, so, so it's a good question because these things generally end up in political or government change because when you get yourself into the situation, the, the solution is now minimum a three year solution, right? So that's one of the things I, I kept thinking a few years ago. I said, 
look, if you want to make this change, the next election is in 2024. I, I said, I would be making that change last year. Because by the time you take the pay and things get better, then it'll be election time. If you start now in mid-2022 and there's a blow to the end of it, you know, um, by the time you see any dividends from this, particularly at this late stage, we're looking at 2025, 26. So, um, so I, I didn't quite understand the thinking that, that, but that's, that's what I would say. The final point I would say is, my only glimmer of hope is in hope, thinking that now that someone's you know taken us by the hand to the edge of the cliff and said, if you don't do the right things now, you're going to be at the bottom of that. I'm hoping that will convince people to, to act and move. And probably just before we attend to this, what is the role of corruption and bad governance in the whole equation of this crisis that we see? Um, it's a hard topic to talk about because I don't have first-hand evidence. Um, but based on hearsay, based on what gets discussed in the media, I think it has been significant. I think um, some of the, some, you know, transactions, some loans, particularly some bilateral loans that have been taken. Uh, and I mentioned some of the projects earlier that the were white elephants. Um, I, I, the understanding is that there was probably a lot of leakage from that. Um, and even now, you know, fuel policy, still, you know, there's stuff on social media about, even at this stage, you know, gas deals being cut, not on best price, but on who's making what. So, um, from conversations I've had um, here, I, I don't think that is something this country has had to worry about. Um, and, and, you know, my, we can all have idealistic goals, but my pragmatic goal is not that Sri Lanka is a zero corruption state. My, my goal is that if corruption, while well, I don't condone it, if it exists, if it exists in a way that goes hand in hand with providing development and advancement for the economy and for the people. Um, and, and I think we are what we've gone far from that. So we'll take this question on the apps. If we go with the United States Ukraine war, then it didn't happen in Sri Lanka? Crisis will still have happened? Yes, oh yes. Um, the pandemic worsened it. Um, I think the foreign exchange issue might have been that we would have kicked the can down the road because the uh, tourism impact would not have been felt as bad. Uh, but the, I, I think the Ukraine war was, um, if you, post pandemic, the Ukraine war has very little impact really. But if we didn't have the pandemic, the Ukraine war would have had, again, less impact. Um, but I, I think, you know, as I said, our first downgrade came well before the, the um, pandemic. Right, it was after that disastrous uh, <coughs> So, uh, how has the private sector reacted to the crisis? I think it's been tough because one of the things, and this is why, you know, when you run out of dollars, it impacts your exports, not just your imports, right? It disrupts supply chains. Um, so, the private sector, you know, had, um, had a glorious time with money printing and Interest rates dropping significantly, um, and they were, you know, and they're seeing the opposite of that. So interest rates, you know, the prime lending rate before the crisis was was probably at around 12 or 13 percent. It went all the way down to five and change. Now it's at 23 percent. Um, so if you're borrowing to build or, or grow your business, you're borrowing at anywhere from 25 to 30 percent. Not a lot of projects that will make you money at that rate. Right? So I think it's, it's going to be a struggle. Um, I think um, labor, the labor is going to be a challenge. I, I think you also will see migration of skilled labor. Um, a lot of last week in my company, we lost two, I have not lost people to you know, any competition in the last year and a half, and I lost two people who wanted to migrate. So I think skilled labor there will be a, a real challenge. Um, but, um, you know, it's been, it's been sad because smart business people have not been given a hearing. 
which is partly why I think we've got to this point. Okay, someone has turned the question around. Any lessons for Sri Lanka from how Fiji embeds? <laughs> um, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are, but because I wasn't in Fiji through that, I'm probably uh, the wrong person to volunteer what, how Fiji managed it, but uh, I'm sure there are. Um, I mean, I, from all the little that I know, I think your vaccination rates are over 100% um, or close to that. Uh, I think you've, um, you know, economically, I think not the medical challenge, but economically, I think there was more foresight in building your buffers during COVID. In Sri Lanka, it was the other way, right? We, and, and it was partly the other way because you had already shot yourself in the foot and closed out capital markets and other things. Even if you wanted to, you couldn't have done much. But what I see here is that I, when I looked at those, you know, of course, we had to do some money printing as well, not to the extent that Sri Lanka did. But, I mean, it will remain to be seen, but the way you build uh, capital reserves buffers, I think uh, something we could have done if we hadn't already, you know, uh, gone down the wrong path on the fiscal side. So someone is asking the question here about remittances. Remittances is a very important part of our BNP. Hundred and forty-two million last year. So, how was this different for Sri Lanka? Yeah. Given the crisis, people send money here. Sure, sure. No, no. And, and look, um, uh, that did start happening. As I said, in, in, in April, May, there was some disruption, and uh, you know, the people living in those in the Middle East, in particular, which is where a lot of Sri Lankan workers are, uh, they came back home due to COVID. But after that, they went back um, by sort of mid-year. Remittances, uh, I didn't, didn't increase, but they were similar to the previous year. So it did, it did increase, but it, it did uh, go back to previous years. Uh, however, it really got disrupted starting in May, June 2021, not because of COVID, uh, because of the foreign exchange issue. By fixing the foreign exchange rate artificially um, low, um, it created you know, more flow of remittances through the black market. So obviously the money has come back to people, which is why that has, still has an impact on inflation. Because people have had spending power, but the, the dollars didn't come into the country. You mentioned the, the slashing of taxes. Significant means drain government revenue significantly. Yeah. And what was the motivation? Was it more political from that angle? Yes. Uh, okay. So. Probably this was something that we did similar here in Fiji as well, when we reduced taxes uh, just before the onset of the crisis uh, significantly. Uh, and I mean, like Sri Lanka, we're probably in a different state. So maybe, uh, can I ask the BS to probably comment on uh, why we are different? Because they had slash taxes and they were in different situations relative to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been very refreshing to be in this room full of technical people and uh, hearing some technical discussions after a long time. So just on the revenue issue, I think it was very clear on the slide, slide I'm glad you have uh, presented this slide on the comparison to Fiji and Sri Lanka. I've taken a photo and we uh, will use it. It's very, very useful. Mm -hmm. So on the revenue issue, it's very clear. And uh, Fiji's revenue to GDP ratio was 26%, 27% pre-COVID. Sri Lanka had somewhere around 11 to 12 percent, half of what we did. The tax reductions after the crisis, the removal of the 10 percent EKL, the 6 percent STT, the stamp duties, uh, the reduction in departure taxes, I think it was unlike Sri Lanka, as Mr. Fernandez has said, there was a number of policy errors. In fact, in Fiji, there was a number of well thought out measures that managed us to uh, get out and not have a crisis similar to Sri Lanka. And we would be in a similar situation that we have not taken those measures. So the reduction, even after the reduction in the revenues, one, there was two key reasons for the reduction in the uh, tax, uh, tax rates. One was tourism is the leading economic sector in Fiji with the closure of borders. At 20 months ago, we realized that once the borders open up, there will be intense competition for tourism, and we need a tourism sector that is competitive. And that's why all those taxes that was dominated in the tourism sector, it was removed 
uh, eliminated to ensure that the tourism industry is more competitive. That was number one. Number two, while we had this structural loss in revenue because we reduced the tax rates, it was carefully done in a manner because at the same time we received additional new sources of revenues, which was one of and uh, which were large budget support grants that were provided from Australia and New Zealand. That provided the buffer for the revenue reduction coming out of the taxes. And that's why despite, if you see post-COVID, despite the, those reduction in taxes, the revenue ratio is still much, much higher than what Sri Lanka, almost double uh, compared to Sri Lanka, even pre-COVID. So it's in a very different situation. And I think there's, based on every single measure, Sri Lanka situation and Fiji situation is very different. And I think it was those measures in terms of the reduction in the uh, taxes that we are now seeing that the tourism industry is recovering very well. Uh, it has beaten almost everybody's expectations. Uh, numbers are uh, really very good uh, based on uh, Vista arrivals still May. It's, almost, it's already 45% of uh, pre-COVID levels, projecting 55%. I just saw some numbers from the Reserve Bank. The yields are much higher, so even though the recovery so far is 45% of pre-COVID in terms of the tourism uh, earnings is much, much higher. Basically, simply means every single tourist is spending much more than what they were spending pre-COVID. So that has helped in terms of foreign exchange. The other significant difference from the revenue situation was while our revenue came down and we had some discompensating measures, our expenditures in the last five years have on nominal terms remained stagnant, on real terms declining. Pre-COVID, if you look at government expenditures, 3.6, 3.7 million. Last budget was again 3.6, 3.7 million. Though it's going to be slightly lower than what was budgeted. Unlike Sri Lanka, they had a revenue challenge and at the same time they increased expenditures. So I think that's my response. Thank you, sir. And probably, uh, Mr. Vlad, you probably have more on that. Well, US $51 billion in debt that the uh, Sri owes and you have the market now in April. And you know, I'm trying to draw, draw the parallel into Fiji. Uh, I see that no one is asking the, the hard question around debt here. Uh, so probably I'll put PS on the spot again. Uh, and we have both one with the issue of debt, the uh, stories and money that we work with up in the media. So we borrowed heavily. Uh, what is the plan, your plan for that? And uh, we should be worried. So maybe I'll answer another question so that then I'll come back to the next question. And the question is, would I have been worried if we did not go in the last 20 months? And my response to that is, I would have been extremely worried if we did not go what we borrowed in the last two years. And we would have been in the Sri Lanka situation much earlier than Sri Lanka. We were in a situation when the borders closed, revenues has come down by 50%. The old, only alternative the government had was to increase borrowing to sustain spending and cater for the additional uh, spending that was required. But I think in Fiji's discussion, we are generally comparing the Sri Lanka debt crisis with Fiji's debt. And I think the crisis in Sri Lanka is much is, is more than a debt crisis, it is a balance of payment foreign exchange crisis. The first graph that we saw is basically Sri Lanka uh, economy not able to import fuel, medicines, because they have run out of foreign exchange, not because the debt level is high. We are a country where we get $2 billion in foreign exchange from tourism every year. At the time when the borders are closed, the last two years the borders have been closed, we have lost somewhere around $4 billion. Had government not borrowed the external debt that we took in the last two years, thanks to the ADB, the World Bank, the JICA, EIG, Australia, New Zealand, and others, our foreign any central banker in the room would tell you that uh, we would have depleted foreign exchange much earlier than Sri Lanka. And we would have been in that crisis much before that. So my fair response is that we, I would, as a technical person, would have been extremely worried if we did not borrow and did what we did in terms of the fiscal response in the last 20 months. The response was well thought out to ensure that we avoid a balance of payment foreign exchange crisis at a time when tourism foreign exchange is not coming. And second was to support uh, the government expenditures and, 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 and go forward. As I've said previously, we cannot have a debate about debt, whether in Fiji or overseas, in isolation from the COVID crisis. It has to be seen in the context of the COVID crisis, 
what happened and had we not borrowed what would have been the consequence. Unfortunately, we cannot experiment what would have happened and we not borrowed. But I think, based on at least my professional judgment, the situation in terms of the economy would have been much devastating, much serious. The contraction would have been close to 30 to 40 percent. The exchange rate would have collapsed and we not borrowed all those for exchange or at least depreciated by devalued by a significant amount. And the social economic situation on the ground would be much different. So this borrowing that happened post-COVID and the debt level that increased post-COVID, that was that has to be seen in, in that context. Having said that, and as we have said, the measures in terms of borrowing that happened in the last two years was appropriate at that point in time. But we should not continue that post-COVID. It's I think taken and we have said in the various budget documents, public statement, that fiscal consolidation, writing on complex uh, government expenditures re-looking at uh, some of the uh, real resources is the way forward and or eventually we'll have to bring the debt levels and to the ratios downwards. So first, if we're not borrowed, I would have been extremely worried. Now, we have done what was appropriate. Moving forward, we have to grow the economy and bring the fiscal uh, situation under control. But it's fast, there's a fast difference compared to the Sri Lanka. And unlike mean, this, Probably I can put 20 indicators that is different compared to Fiji and uh, Sri Lanka, and one is that we still have uh, uh, chemical fertilizers. <laughs> so, Mr. Blair, this is the last two questions for you. Uh, in your view, I know you're not a political person, but someone has kind of posed the political the avoidance of the same as you do to yourselves, proximity to China instead of the US. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I don't think you have to be political to answer this question. This is really about. Um, Again, being more analytical, um, I, I don't believe that there would have. Uh, let's take a step back. The implication of this question is: Was there an impact on Sri Lanka during this crisis from being close to China? I think the one area, the obvious area that stands out is one of the points I made earlier about the return on investment of some of the debt we got from China. I think there were significant amounts of debt that we uh, received that, and then utilized on, as I termed it, the white development projects. Uh, and then this is not, you know, this is not a secret. I think it's as well um, followed by the media. I, I think we, so that that's probably a few billion dollars worth of uh, um, savings for the country. Um, now, would it, how would it have been different if you were close to the U.S.? Well, the U.S. I don't think would have provided funding to those levels. Um, I, I don't think there are mechanisms to do that. Um, so along with the Chinese debt that supported some of those white elephants, there's also Chinese debt and projects that supported productive investments. Um, I don't think the U.S. would have had an organization uh, or an institution that should, would have supported those necessarily. Um, so, you know, it comes with pros and cons, I guess. And, and look, I, I think it's the, the easy thing for people is to look at China and say, China has done the right thing, not that China has done the wrong, wrong thing. Ultimately, the reci recipient countries' leaders have to take responsibility of the war, right? I, I think they have to take responsibility for how you structure these, how you evaluate these, evaluating the uh, that, uh, impact to, to the host countries, um, and, and making sure that you can contain any un unintended consequences. So, I mean, it always takes two to tango. Um, so, I, 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 I'm not sure I could say what would have been close or not. What I do know is if we isolated China and got close just to the US, I don't think the US necessarily has a funding program to, 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 to uh, for countries like Sri Lanka. And probably just to wrap things up for us this evening, or uh, this is a point. And since you put me on the spot, I have the opportunity to say something more. <laughs> so I think there's a technical person looking at Sri Lanka and the situation and 
he is demonstrated to the I will be the most worried person uh, if we had a, a major Sri Lanka kind of challenge, as, as you have said earlier. And I think by every indicator, there is vast differences. Number one, Sri Lanka has almost run out of foreign exchange in less than one month, or less than zero point five if you exclude the swaps. Fiji is of yesterday at 3.4 billion dollars of reserves, close to 9.5 months of import cover, number one. In terms of debt servicing, our interest, domestic interest payments every year is around 300 million dollars. In a normal year, we have more than 3 billion dollars in tax revenues to service the debt. We have 10 times more revenues available, uh, fiscal revenues available to service domestic debt. And we have 30 times more foreign exchange available to service our external debt, and which is Sri Lanka in a situation to get, if I remember the numbers correctly, a debt repayment of $7 billion, foreign exchange was somewhere around $2 billion. That's where we are going to be at 34. Number three, Sri Lanka's lenders, the market has given a loud message to Sri Lanka that the debt is unsustainable and stop lending to Sri Lanka. In Fiji, over the number of lenders in Fiji have increased. Previously, we had just traditional lenders. Now, with the ADB, the World Bank, the JICA, the IIB, the IIFFP, IIIB, all these lenders have come to lend to Fiji. And why are they lending to Fiji? Because one, they have the confidence that Fiji will be able to repay their debt. Nobody is going to lend. Um, I can see some of the banks here. Nobody is going to lend to someone if you are not able to buy. Number one, that's one. Second is they lend. Most of these are multilateral banks. And unlike Sri Lanka, we do not have any exposure to international market debt. There is none. So, uh, the multilaterals and a few bilaterals with uh, JICA and uh, China. And uh, I think that puts us in a very, very safe situation. And every time I sometimes, even the debate in Fiji, have rethought about it, talked to a lot of people, is it anywhere close? And I think it has been very refreshing and reassuring to see those slides and from an independent person like you to be here. So and in our children and lenders have stopped lending, how do you judge whether a country has a debt situation? Your, market, your lenders will tell you very, very loudly. In Fiji, our lenders have been lending, they have lent five times more than what they were lending pre-COVID. Because the, as I said, like <coughs> the policy makers, the multilaterals also, accepted and reaffirmed that the policy response to the crisis was appropriate and that's why they came on board and they funded. Sri Lanka market debt, we have no market debt. Fifty percent of the external debt that we borrowed in the last 20 months, fifty percent is highly concessional debts. You are an investment banker, we have borrowed from the World Bank at 40 year terms, 0.75% uh, uh, savings charge, 10 year grace period. So that's a concessional element of 50, uh, almost 57, 60 percent. And those funds were used, as I said, return on investment needs to match what you're doing. Being able to access such concessional debt gave us the opportunity to fund some of the projects in the social sector, in terms of unemployment, and not necessarily public infrastructure projects where you need to have adequate returns. And because the cost of debt was much, much cheaper. And given that most of this debt is external debt, all of them, they also, these lenders, they also do their economic analysis and ensure that there's a debt for return. The World Bank has recently I mean, uh, uh, provided another debt, generally for the social sector. Similarly, JICA is also lending 40 year terms, 0.01 interest rate, 10 year interest rate, 10 year interest rate. So, as I said, we can put a big chart of uh, the difference between Sri Lanka and uh, Thank you, Piers, for that So. Mr. Pereira, you come with impressive credentials. If the president of Sri was to appoint you as minister for finance uh, next week, would you take it up? Uh, and after that, please, yes, what would you do? <laughs> yeah. Yes, let's, let's not ask the question of the <laughs> Um Look, I mean, uh, the reason I, uh, I'm joking about it, but look, the reality is, I, I think. A big part of why the country is in that situation is a governance issue. It's, it's not an economic issue, it's a governance issue. And, you know, um, you, know you don't want to put a, you know, drive a you know, good car into a gravel road and not get it where uh, I'm not going to put a good car. But what I'm saying is, you know, if you have, uh, you know, 
good thoughts or good ideas and how what needs to be done, you need to know that it's to be done in an environment where people will be receptive to that. Um, but what would I do if, if I hypothetically, very hypothetically, um, took the role? I, I would, you know, first and foremost, I think, you know, we need to speed up the IMF process because it's not about, IMF is not going to give us lots of money. It's not about that. It's the confidence it builds. Because right now you're asking people to, it's, it's like you know, a company, you're going to ask um, for money and say, but I don't have an accountant or a controller in the company to keep track of how I'm going to use it. I don't have a strategic plan uh, to keep track of how I'm going to spend it. Um, and I don't have a board who's going to oversee how I'm going to use it. With the IMF, that the IMF is in a position to monitor and control those things, uh, and, and therefore that's why it's critically important. This was the the infantile debate that we went through uh, about whether to bring IMF or not. Without the IMF, a lot of the other lenders won't come. So that's first step. I would get that done by the end of July. I would try to get funding before the end of the year. Um, with that, I would try and you know uh, then in parallel start on a process of um, they had this word privatization, but um, you can call it peopleization or whatever it is. I think uh, you have to get some of these uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, and, and not just the you know to put it in management terms, not just the dogs, but the cash cows as well. Um, because you, you can't expect people to just come and you know be silly enough to only buy your bad assets. Um, I would um, probably have to restructure the rupee debt as well, and and so for that I think that's a very sensitive topic because if, you know uh, uh, some of the banks, insurance companies, the pension fund, are very exposed to that. First thing would be to restructure the treasury bills, which is the short term ones, because most of that is owned by the central bank. Um, so we can contain the impact. Um, so that's that's an important, I think, something central bankers to think about when we talk about this issue of money printing. You need to know where, you know, where where the exit is when you, when you do that. Um, then beyond that, I think um, you have to make. Um, you know, we've always been very weak with our foreign direct investment. I think the best of years we probably had two percent of GDP. I think in Fiji it's probably been close to. Um, or five percent um, of GDP, so, and that's that's about really ease of doing business. That's something I think we really need to cut the red tape um, and, and get people to come in because there are hundreds of countries, dozens of countries that people can go and invest in real business in these days. Everyone has their selling points, but you know until we get. Um, some kind of foreign direct investment, we are not going to have permanent capital because lending is not going to solve, solve the problems. And then I think the final thing I would look at is I would look for all any kind of concessional you know, support I can get to improve skills. In the longer term, we have 96% education or literacy. Rate. I say, you know, people have education without skills. I mean, you, can, you have literacy, but you need to be able to do productive value-adding business or value-adding roles to generate something back for your country. And I think that's, those are some of the critical factors. And then, of course, there's industrial strategy and stuff that you need to look at. Um, um, and then I would commit to uh, floating the um, currency um, to get all the remittances back. So, I know there are a few things that I would do. Thank you. So, that brings us to the end of the presentation uh, this evening. Just in the interest of time, let me just summarize some of the key lessons. The first, which I think was very important, was on the importance for decision makers and in the bureaucracy to be technically proficient and also to have the right expertise. The second was on the importance of prudent fiscal management, thinking prudently and smartly about our fiscal and finances, about debt, about tax policies, and for policies, politicians who not to overpromise, probably, uh, as there are always trade-offs involved. Related to that, the importance for the central bank uh, to be proactive and diligent in ensuring that there is always foreign exchange to meet all of foreign obligations.
the third uh, is on good governance and the importance of institutions uh, combating corruption. We cannot eliminate it, but it is important that we confront it head on. So that basically is a wrap for us this evening. Uh, I will now hand over back to our MC. It was a pleasure moderating this evening. Yes, so before I uh, step away from the podium, I want to thank uh, the governor uh, for inviting me uh, to this today. And uh, obviously, it's been a great pleasure spending time uh, the last few days in Fiji. And, and um, it has been a bonus for me to get to know some of the leaders of policy making and, and, and business, and, and of course, the central bank here. Uh, I do think that, uh, I hope this is useful. I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, I, I didn't mean to just criticize my nation, but to me it was like, you know, if, if you've had a child who's had, you know, gone down the wrong path and uh, had some, made some big mistakes, I would be very happy to tell another parent uh, so that the child does not go down the same path. So that's the spirit in which uh, I've said it. So I. Hopefully, I'm not going to uh, get a call from my officials back home with um, social media posts about uh, <laughs> a disgruntled speech. Yeah, that it wasn't to be disgruntled, but I hope, it, uh, in all sincerity, I hope uh, some of the learnings will be useful and uh, some of the context will be useful uh, because none of this is easy. I mean, it's easy to analyze it and give a speech about it after the fact, but. And you'll be a great audience. Thank you for all the questions as well.